So now we're going to complete our look at human genetics by understanding a couple of different exceptions to what we consider normal Mendelian inheritance. We referred to these exceptions before in our chromosomes lecture, but we're going to sort of expand upon them by looking at real life examples of these exceptions in this next flowchart. So we'll entitle the flowchart Exceptions to Mendelian Inheritance. Now we understand that we would consider, for the most part, Mendelian inheritance patterns to be relatively normal. These are the normal things that we expect as a geneticist. But when we were looking at human genetics specifically, we see different exceptions to the Mendelian rules. Most, notab most notably, these exceptions can be seen in something like genomic imprinting. So genomic imprinting is a very interesting idea and concept that deals with epigenetics, okay? And this is a term that's going to give us an idea about how the phenotype of an individual depends on, okay, specifically depends on if the allele itself that determines the phenotype is from mom or dad. So this is interesting to state that this is non-Mendelian, of course, because what we're stating is if dad gives a certain allele, the phenotype will be different, or if mom gives a certain allele, the phenotype will be different. Now this specifically, this genomic imprinting we can state, actually is going to occur during gen um, gamete formation. So we'll say it occurs during gamete formation. And why is that important? Why do we have to focus on gamete formation? Of course, this is because gametes are what are going to be passed down from parent to offspring. And if this is going to be dependent on an allele from mom or dad, that allele must be present within the gamete. So what we state is that during this gamete formation, what we have is this sort of silencing event. We have this idea of, the, of a silencing occurring on a particular allele. So we'll say silences particular allele um, of certain genes. And we're going to get back to that sort of definition when we look at the actual example of genomic imprinting. And we can also state that genomic imprinting is most often understood when we look at how genes are often imprinted Okay, so this is the term that we're using and why it's called genomic imprinting. Genes are imprinted differently whether or not they are in sperm or egg. So this is what we mean. This is sort of the idea behind a phenotype depends on if the allele is from mom, aka if the gene being imprinted on is within the egg, or if the phenotype is dependent on whether or not the allele is from dad, or if the gene being imprinted on is within the sperm. So the imprinting patterns are different. And the key idea behind this difference is that the zygote itself, the combination of sperm and egg, will only express one of those imprinting results. It only expresses, we'll say, um, only one. Only one allele of imprinted gene. So we'll just squeeze that in right over here. So that's a concept we have to understand based off of our knowledge of genomic, very basic knowledge of genomic imprinting. I think the best way to understand genomic imprinting is to look at the classic example. And in this classic example, we're going to be looking at a mouse gene specifically. The mouse genome is very similar to ours. We can't do the specific Im genomic imprinting example within us because of the ethical implications. But in mice, this is possible. There's a mouse gene that we're going to be looking at, and it specifically codes for a protein known as IGF-2, insulin growth factor 2. And IGF-2 is something that is prenatal. It's a prenatal protein essential for growth. So we'll say prenatal um, essential for growth. So if you have a functioning IGF-2, you are going to grow as normal within the natal environment. And you actually have to make sure that IGF-2, I'll tell you this right now, you need it to be expressed within dad. So you need, let's say, dad over here, need dad to express IGF-2 within his sperm gamete for you to have IGF-2 functioning normally as a developing embryo. 
So what does this all mean? The best way to understand genomic imprinting is to look at the difference between a homozygote individual and a heterozygote individual. We'll do the homozygote first. In a homozygote individual, we're going to look at the dad chromosome, otherwise known as the dad's genes, and we're going to be comparing them to the mom chromosome or the mom's genes. What do we expect in a homozygote? Homo meaning the same, zygote meaning the individual. The dad chromosomes will have, let's say, I'll tell you, normal IGF-2, so normal insulin growth, growth factor 2, and the mom chromosome will also have a matching normal IGF-2 genotype. And this is going to result in overall a mouse that is born that is normal a normal mouse. This is not of interest to us as geneticists because we're trying to look at the abnormal, the other side of the story, and that side of the story is most accurately represented when we look at the heterozygote individual. The heterozygote individual is going to give us a very interesting overall result because we're going to see a bit of a difference than the homozygote result. In the sense that, if you imagine you have a normal dad, okay, a normal dad mouse, combining with and mating with a mutant mom. And what I mean by normal and mutant in this situation is that the dad has normal IGF-2, the mom has a mutant version of IGF-2. You expect to see a normal mouse. And contrastingly, and I think this is where the interesting part of this comes in, what if you switch the roles? What if you have a mutant dad mating with a normal mom mouse, okay? How is this going to affect the child, the offspring? This is actually going to give you what we consider a mutant, and that mutant mouse is going to be a dwarf mouse. Dwarf meaning much smaller than usual. Why is it much smaller than usual? It does not accurately express IGF-2. Why not? Because the dad was mutant. And I told you that you absolutely need the dad to express this. You need the dad to have a genomic imprint within his sperm in order for the heterozygote individual to give you a normal mouse. Which situation did we have a normal mouse? When the dad was normal and when the dad was expressing only one allele of the imprinted IGF-2 gene, did we have a normal mouse offspring. We had a mutant dwarf mouse when we switched the roles and the dad was mutant. Because the dad was mutant, we had a different genomic imprinted result. And then finally, we can conclude this idea of an exception to Mendelian inheritance by looking at the inheritance of organelle genes. So we'll write the next part as the inheritance of organelle genes. So these are all genes that are not within our regular genome. These are genes that are actually found within things like mitochondria and chloroplasts. Okay, so chloroplasts, we do not have those, but plants do. And within mitochondria and chloroplasts, we have um, circular DNA because of the bacterial ancestry associated with those two structures. And because they are circular independent pieces of DNA, they reproduce independently of the entire cell and they also transmit their own information, their own genetics, their own genes to daughter organelles. And so this is a bit different than what we expect in Mendelian normal cell-to-cell -cell, uh, inheritance. Right now we have mitochondria-to-mitochondria -mitochondria inheritance. And specifically, this type of inheritance is often um, referred to as maternal inheritance, especially in humans. Why maternal inheritance in terms of organelle genes? Well, what happens in humans is that the developing zygote, okay, that growing zygote, that first sperm plus egg cell, actually gets its cytoplasm. It gets the majority of its cell real estate from the egg. That means that the mother plays a crucial, crucial role when mom and dad, sperm plus egg, combine to give you zygote. This means that because the majority of the cytoplasm comes from the egg, that means that the majority of the organelles seen within a growing zygote come from mom. So the organelles are from mom. And what does that mean in terms of inheritance? That means that 
every individual that is born, every human individual that is born is going to display maternal inheritance of organelle genes, of genes of the mitochondria specifically, and thus diseases that happen, abnormalities that happen within the mitochondria are all through maternal, um, let's say, origins. Are the diseases are through maternal, mother, MT, meaning mitochondria, DNA. Diseases happen through maternal mitochondrial DNA inheritance. So that just shows you the importance of the mom in this situation. The egg gives us all of the organelles, majority of the organelles. The sperm, for the most part, simply provides half of the DNA. The egg also provides half the DNA, but it also provides a lot of cytoplasm. Thus, it provides organelle genes as well. And finally, we can conclude our discussion on human genetics by looking a little further at these diseases. And finally, these diseases are mostly going to affect, because they work in the mitochondria, ATP synthesis. And if they infect, uh, affect ATP synthesis, they're going to cause problems. And these problems will often eventually lead to things like muscle and nervous system overall problems. Nervous, uh, let's say, system problems. Basically, what we mean by this is that if you have mitochondrial problems, you will have things like mitochondrial myopathy. That's a term given to people who have inherited from the mother problems with the mitochondria. These mitochondrial problems will result overall into weakness and basically intolerance to exercise, which will then further lead to muscle, um, let's say, uh, complete deterioration. Mitochondrial myopathy is really, really bad. It's a big, big problem with ATP synthesis, thus it's a big problem with muscle formation causing muscle deterioration. And the final, last syndrome that we'll talk about in human genetics is something known as Leber's syndrome. In this syndrome, we have a sudden blindness at the age of 20, all due to ATP synthesis problems and also major problems within oxidative phosphorylation. So that concludes our look at human genetics. We finish by looking at the ideas that are exceptions to our normal idea of Mendelian inheritance by noticing that there are more complexities than just simple Mendelian's inheritance patterns, specifically through things like genomic imprinting and the inheritance of organelle genes.